Amen. All right, here in the story we have the, the famous uh, passage of the two men who are on the road to Emmaus. You have Cleopas and you have the stranger that is with him that's not mentioned by name here, so we're not exactly sure who it is. And then, obviously, there's another stranger who is later revealed to be the Lord Jesus Christ. While they're walking and they're talking, uh, they're going back and forth, and, and Jesus, when he's speaking to them, he kind of inquires about why they are sad. That's what we're going to pick up here in verse number 19. It says, And he said unto them, What thanks? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. So, from all that they know, the man that they're speaking to, this stranger who is the Lord Jesus Christ, he's clueless about who they are talking about and who this great man is, right? And the way that the great man of God, that they want to summarize the Lord Jesus Christ to the stranger is by saying that he is a prophet, and then they say this, mighty in deed and word. So notice those are the two elements that are given if once they're trying to describe or explain to this person or to this one, whoever this may be, which is the Lord Jesus Christ in their eyes, they are not sure of that yet. They say that he is a that he was a prophet, that he was mighty, that he was mighty. It says this indeed and word. I want you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. If we were to continue reading there, verse number 20, it said, And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. And then they say this, But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. So they're getting ready to explain to him that he was the Christ. That's what they were explaining. That we thought that this was the Redeemer. We thought that this was the Christ, right? But prior to that, when just calling him a great man of God or calling him a prophet of God, they referred to him as being mighty in deed and in word. The title of the sermon this morning is Word and Deed. Word and Deed. Now, those two things that we're going to go through here and see it mentioned all throughout the Bible. This morning's sermon is going to be a very simple sermon, but it's going to be an extremely practical sermon. There are two elements to the Christian life. Two elements to the Christian life that will enable you to be a successful Christian. If you break it down in its most simplistic form, it is this, word and deed. Now, over in Luke 24, he worded these in the opposite order. He said deed and word. I put these two in the order that they are found the majority of times in the Bible. I put these two in the order as though they are stepping stones because the very first one would be word and then the second the, the second growth if you will the second step of the Christian life in, in uh, you know in the direction of success would be deed. Now we know that Jesus Christ was mighty in word because why? Because he spoke the words of God. The words that he spake were the words of God. Why? Because he was God. He was the word made flesh. And when he went around, people knew and people heard the authority. Even those that were unsaved, even those that rejected him, they heard and they understood this man has authority. There's something different about his words. Even when we read in that passage itself later on, what do we see them say to one another? Did not our hearts burn within us when he spoke with us? There was something different about his words. I want you to look at 2 Timothy chapter number 3. Verse number 14, this is Paul writing to Timothy, and he says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and has been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scripture. So what he's telling him to continue in, what he's telling him that he had learned that he needs to continue in, is the Holy Scriptures. And then he says this, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Just a quick nugget to disprove dispensationalism. At this time, did Timothy have the New Testament bound and given to him? No. So what holy scriptures is he referring to? The Old Testament. Did you notice what he said there? He said, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. And even, and let's say this, even especially when Timothy was a child, is there any way that he would have any of the books of the New Testament? Not possible, is it? Notice what it says about the holy scriptures. 
It says, And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Amen. The Old Testament is able to make you wise unto salvation through faith which is Amen. in Christ Jesus. Amen. You can, you know, obviously we can even just look at the New Testament's record of when Jesus shows up and when John the Baptist. Let's say when John the Baptist shows up, and what are they, who do they suppose that he is? The Christ. They're all waiting for the Christ. That's the, the Old Testament. They're just waiting for the Messiah to come to save them. All those that were saved in the Old Testament, they were looking and they were waiting for the promised Messiah to come and deliver them. They may have been looking through a glass darkly, if you will. They may have not had all the details, but that's who they were waiting for, God to send the Messiah. And then throughout Scripture, it was, you know, more details were revealed. And later on, even, it became very clear that this Messiah was indeed God with us. He was the, you know, the branch, the Lord, our righteousness. So even by the time they knew that God was coming in the flesh, even by the time John the Baptist came. Amen. But that's not what I want to focus on. I'll read one more time verse 15, and then I want to look at verses 16 and 17 here. So the Bible says in, in 2 Timothy 3, 15, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation, through faith which is in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, saying that God breathed these. these. These words, what we consider scripture, come out of the words or come out of the mouth of God. It would be the words of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. <clears throat> now watch this. And is profitable for doctrine. So notice that too. All scripture is profitable for doctrine. So every bit of scripture in the Bible, everything that is scripture, you can learn something from it as far as teaching. That's what doctrine is. It's something that is taught, teaching. And then he says this, for reproof. <clears throat> that is to be corrected in a light manner. For reproof. He repeats it and says this, for correction. And then he says, for instruction in righteousness. Now, now watch this in verse number 17. That that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So right here he's talking about it. It uses the word perfect. Now the word perfect in the Bible means complete. The word perfect means complete. You can see this definition used over and over again and referring to something being perfect. Like over in James chapter number 1, he says that ye may be perfect and entire. Uh, and then he says, wanting nothing, saying lacking nothing, right? That you have everything, perfect and entire. What is something that is entire? You know, an entire circle would be the complete circle, right? It would be all of it, right? So he's saying that you may be perfect, and then he repeats it and says, and entire, you know, lacking or wanting. He says, wanting nothing. So right here when it says perfect, he's talking about being a complete Christian, so what is the very first step to being a complete Christian? It would be reading the scriptures. And one of the things that you benefit from of reading the scriptures or reading the word of God, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. So a part of it is something that you are just going to learn, something that you are going to have in your mind, teachings, right? That's how it would begin, right? For reproof, so it would correct things in your life, and again, for correction, and then it says for instruction. That's before you make the mistake. Being instructed and knowing what to do from this point forward. Or maybe you've never even heard this before. Now knowing where to go from this point forward. For instruction in righteousness. And then it says this in verse 17. That. So the word that there is a result. Right? You understand what I'm saying? Because of that, this is the consequence. That the man of, that the man of God may be perfect. Saying that he may be complete. Truly furnished unto all good works. So another thing that you can learn from this passage is you don't need anything else other than the Bible. Amen. He says, so he's, he's explaining that you have the Holy Scriptures and you're given this and, and you get all these benefits from the Scriptures that the man of God may be perfect. That tells me that if I have the Scriptures, I can be perfect. I can be complete. And where in this, in this stepping stones that take place here, verse number one, where does it begin with? It begins with the Word, right? You first have to sit down and you first have to read the Word. You first have to understand the Word. You first have to know what to do. If there are actions that take place as a result of that, you first have to be instructed, therefore, so that you know what to perform later on or what to perform as a result of that. So we see there at the end, he says that the man of God may be perfect, that's complete, truly furnished unto all good works. There are things in the Bible that are just would be considered meat in the Bible. And a lot, and, and you know, I wouldn't say a lot of it, but some of it are things that you will just store in your mind a lot. 
A lot, uh, some of it are things that you will just, you won't necessarily perform, if you will, but they will just be things that, that are spoken. They will just be understandings that you have that can help you, right, throughout your life that you may pass along and convey to others as in words, right? But then you can notice that a big part of that, of being perfect, is, is that you would be furnished unto all good works. So if you don't have the works, you're not complete. You're not a complete Christian. And when they want to talk about how Jesus Christ was a complete man of God, they wanted to praise him as a man of God above other men of God. They said he's not only a prophet in word, he's not only a prophet in deed, they said he was mighty in deed and in word. A complete Christian is one that not only knows the Bible, that not only knows the words of God, that not only can speak the oracles of God or speak the words of God, but he is one that also performs the word of God in his life. If you only have deeds, you're not a complete Christian. If you only have the word of God, you're not a complete Christian. To be a complete, to be a perfect Christian, to be a Christian that is mature, you must be mighty in word and in deed. Amen. In word and in deed. And where does it begin? Does it begin with the deeds? No, you can't perform that which you don't know what, what to do. You have to begin with the Bible. So you know what you have to do, number one, is you have to read the Bible. You have to, you have to read the Bible. Let's look at Acts chapter number 18, verse number 24. Acts chapter number 18, verse number 24. Again, that's Acts chapter number 18, verse number 24. And I am going to read to you quickly from Romans chapter number 15. Romans chapter number 15, you don't need to turn there. Romans 15 verse 18, it says, For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me. And then he says, To make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. So notice, when he wanted to praise them, and he wanted to say the Gentiles were doing great things, and he wanted to talk about how God had used him to get them to grow as a Christian to a certain point in their life, in maturity, he doesn't say they're only great in word. He doesn't say they're only great in deed. They're great in word. They're mighty in word. They're mighty in deed. They were obedient by word and deed. Both. They're both important. Look at Acts chapter number 18, verse number 24. Acts chapter number 18, verse number 24. We're going to look at being mighty in the scriptures or being mighty in word. Verse number 24, it says, And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria... An eloquent man. He means he's a, he's a good speaker, right? He's articulate, if you will. And mighty in the scriptures. Came to Ephesus. So notice, it says right there that he's mighty in the scriptures. He's mighty in the word of God. What does mighty mean? It means he's strong in the scriptures. If you reference something in the, in, you know, the Old Testament, Apollos is going to know what you're talking about. Apollos is going to be able to explain to you and, and, and maybe cross-reference other scriptures with that. Apollos is going to be able to give you a deeper understanding that he's strong in the Bible. I mean, what a great... I mean, that's the first step right there. And when you really love the Bible, you know, when you meet somebody that's mighty in the scriptures, you want to hang around that person because you want to learn more about the Bible, right? When somebody's always talking about the Bible, you like to be around those types of people, right? So notice right here, he was the type of guy... That was mighty in the scriptures. He knew the Old Testament very well. He knew what he had of the Bible at that time. He was mighty. He was strong in the scriptures. It says, he came to Ephesus, verse 25. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord. So what is this? This is him being mighty in word, right? He's being, he's being spoken of as being mighty in word. It says, knowing only the baptism of John. So he, he was aware of John's preaching. He was aware of everything that John had come and had revealed. Because new truths came with John. We have those recorded in our, in our New Testament. And he, was no, he knew only the baptism of John. So he was in some way ignorant, maybe because of his geographical location. He was ignorant of things that had played out afterwards of the Christ. Verse 26, and he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. So we see again him being mighty in word. He knew the scriptures and he's preaching it, right? He spoke boldly. It says, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard him, they took him unto, unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly, meaning more complete, right? It says in verse number 27, and when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he was come, helped them much, which had believed through grace. So notice he's benefiting people, right? He's, he's, he's able to, to benefit them. And then it says in verse number 28 again, something that it keeps 
highlighting about his personality, about his good qualities. Verse 28, for he mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. So when it tells you up there earlier on in verse number 24 that he is mighty in the scriptures, how does that play out? Verse 28, for he mightily convinced the Jews. So being mighty in the scriptures allows you or enables you to be able to mightily convince other people, to be able to persuade other people of the truth in the Bible. You may even have a slight understanding of some sort of doctrine in the Bible. Somebody may have explained it to you. Somebody may have showed you a couple of scriptures. And then you go to present that to somebody. And you're not necessarily mighty in the scriptures, especially in that sense, especially in that doctrine. When you go to explain that to that person, whoever you may be speaking to, they may bring up another verse that you're not aware of, right? Because you're not mighty in that area, you're not able to persuade them. But he, when he came and preached, it says, for he mightily convinced the Jews. Using that exact same word, why was he mightily able to convince the Jews? Because he was mighty in the scriptures. Because he knew they would bring up a verse, hey, how can it be the Christ because of this? You know what he was able to do? Well, did you not read here? And then he'd explain it to them. Hey, he can't be the Christ. You know where he was born? And then they, he would bring up another verse and explain that away, right? He was able to just show them mightily because he knew the Bible well, because he was mighty in the scriptures. He was mighty in word, right? Not only that, there it says, for he mightily convinced the Jews, and it, and it says, and that publicly. So another thing that we can learn about this verse, it says publicly. That ties in earlier where it says in verse 26, and he began to speak boldly. So what is him speaking publicly? What is him, what is him going and just speaking in the synagogues? It's him being bold. Him not being scared to go in and to preach to those that do not necessarily or have not necessarily understood or believed in the Christ yet or understood and believed who the Messiah was. It says, showing by the scriptures, there at the end of verse 20, 28, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. So he was able to just take you in the Old Testament and prove to you without a shadow of a doubt that this man who was Jesus was the Christ, the coming Messiah. I mean, I'm sure God, when he looked down and he's getting people saved, you know, Apollos is able, like, you know, people are bringing up verses. I'm sure, you know, like the Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God. I'm sure he looked at him and said, that's a man that is approved. That right there is a man that, that has no need to be ashamed, right? He was a man that was mighty in word. I want, you have, I want to have you turn to another passage. Actually, just flip back. Let's look at this while we're here. Acts chapter number 17. Acts chapter number 17, verse number 11. Acts chapter number 17. We'll read verse 10 first. So the Bible doesn't mention Apollos being mighty in, in deed, but it doesn't say that he's not. So he also may have been a man that was mighty in deed as well. He was definitely a man that was mighty in word. We know that he's a man mighty in deed in the sense of being a soul winner. Because that is a deed. That is a work. That is something that you have to physically get up and you have to physically go do, right? He had to walk to the temple. He had to go out and stand on his feet all day publicly showing people the scriptures. But first, before he could go there, before he could go there and, and, and stay there all day and perform that deed, what did he have to do? The very first step was he had to be mighty in the scriptures. He had to know the word of God, right? You look in Acts chapter number 17, verse number 10, the Bible says this. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews... These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. So this is the Holy Spirit speaking, telling you these men are noble men. They are men of high regard. They're noble. They have integrity is what that means. They were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. So they wanted to hear the Bible. They were willing and wanting to hear the words of the Bible. So they're receiving the word with all readiness of mind. But don't miss this. And, and. It's a conjunction, so there's something else that they also did. And search the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. So these were also people that were mighty in the word. And how do you know that? Because they're studying the Bible. They're trying to figure out what's true and what's not. You're presented with things that are false sometimes in Christianity. You're presented with things that are true. And you can't just believe everything that you hear because there's a lot of false doctrine. What do you have to do? You have to go to the source. What's the source of how you're going to be perfectly, you're, how you're going to be perfect and thoroughly furnished unto all good works in the first place? What makes you perfect? What's the source of everything that we know? What's the basis of Christianity? It begins with the Word of God. It begins with the Word. Amen. That's how we find out everything that we know about Jesus. That's how we find out God's attributes. That's how we know who the Creator is. That's how we know the plan of salvation. 
everything comes from the Bible. Amen. And the Christian's life begins at the Bible. The Christian's life begins at the Word. Why was Jesus Christ a, a man that was mighty in deed and word? Number one, the words that he spoke were the words of God. That's why he told the Pharisees in John chapter number 8, when he told them that, ye therefore hear them not, saying the words, ye therefore hear them not, because you are not of God. The verse prior to that is where he tells them that they don't hear the word of God, that they cannot hear the word. He that is of God heareth God's word. Ye therefore hear them not, because you're not of God. Who was the one speaking, and what, whose words were they not understanding? It was the Christ's words. It was Jesus' words. He's saying, you don't hear these words because you're not of God. Saying the words that I speak are the words of God. So where, are, how are we going to be mighty in word? We have to understand the Bible. We have to read the Bible. I want you to go to 1 Timothy chapter number 4. 1 Timothy chapter number 4. 1 Timothy chapter number 4, verse number 13. Real quick, I'm going to give you a couple admonitions in the New Testament to read and to know the Bible. It says in 1 Timothy chapter number 4, verse 13, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. So we know what he says to reading. He's not saying, hey, make sure you read you know, the latest literature by all the poets. No, he tells them in the same sentence, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. So he's telling them, hey, read the Bible. You need to read the Bible. You need to learn doctrine by reading the Bible. Turn over to uh, 1 Peter chapter number 4, verse 11. 1 Peter chapter number 4, verse 11. 2 Timothy 2.15, I quoted earlier, or alluded to it, says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. So notice it says, study to show thyself approved unto God. And what did the Holy Spirit say to those in Thessalonica, or uh, those in Berea? They said that they were more noble than those in Thessalonica. So what does it mean to, when, when he calls the noble? We look at 2 Timothy chapter number 2 and he says, study to show thyself approved. The Holy Spirit was the one that said that they were more noble. Saying that they were approved of God. They were, they didn't need to be ashamed. If you look at 1 Peter 1 Peter chapter number 4, verse number 11. The Bible tells you this. 1 Peter chapter number 4, verse number 11. We'll read verse 10 as well. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Verse 11, it says this. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. And then he goes on. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God given. Saying the words that we speak, we should try to frame our words around the word of God. Anytime that you're speaking, you should try to base things on the word of God. Our philosophies, the things that we teach other people, whether we're at work, it doesn't matter where you are, when you're teaching your children, should be the words of God. You know, I wish that I could get to a place where everything that, that, you know, obviously we're all, you know, men, we're sinners, but I wish that everything that came out of my mouth could be in some way based upon the Word of God. I mean, that would be, and that's what Jesus Christ was. That's why he was just a man that no one could ever be compared unto. Our example, right? Everything he spoke was perfect because he was the Word of God, the walking Word of God. And we should strive just because it's something that we know that we could never fully attain doesn't mean that you shouldn't attempt to do it. Doesn't mean, you know, and you know how you're going to do that? It all starts with reading the Bible. You're not going to just start quoting verses you've never, you know, memorized. You're not going to just quote or, or maybe, you know, uh, refer to a passage maybe that you've never even read. So it all begins with studying the Bible. It all begins with learning God's Word. You know, and then the second step, I'll have you turn to... I'm going to have you go ahead and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. The second step after you've accomplished or after you have began to learn the word and to speak the word, the second step is to be mighty indeed. This would be the entirety of the Christian life. Would be to be mighty in word, but then as a result of that mighty indeed. We shouldn't just learn things. Learn things in the Bible and never put them into practice. The reason we come to church is not only just to learn doctrine that we can't use, but it's also to have practical sermons. If you had a church where the pastor only taught doctrine and he only taught the meat of the words, things that people couldn't put into practice, you would have a congregation or a church of people that are living very sinful lives, that are living lives that are not pleasing to God. 
If, if you have a pastor that's not teaching, especially if they're not, if he's not teaching them to read the Bible on their own. The only way that that, that, that church could succeed indeed is if maybe they were reading the Bible on their own. But the pastor obviously would be lacking. Because there's two steps. You need to be mighty in word, but then you also need to take the word. You also need to put it into practice and be mighty in the deed. Mighty in deed. If you were one that spoke the words of God... If you were going to just speak the Bible, you know, you knew the, the scriptures very well and you taught the Bible to people, you're going to come across things that need to be put into practice. And what we call the person that is mighty in word, but he's not mighty in deed. Someone that taught someone to do something, someone that highlighted things in the Bible that you need to do, but then they don't do it. They would be a hypocrite, of course, right? I'm going to read to you a couple here to, to conclude the first step of being mighty in word, admonitions to read your Bible. Matthew chapter 22, verse 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. A fuller reading of that in, a, in the parallel of Mark 12, verse 24 says this, And Jesus answering said unto them, Do ye not therefore err, because ye know not the scriptures, neither the power of God? For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. And as touching the dead that they rise, have ye not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob? He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. And he says, ye therefore do greatly err. Why? Because they were not mighty in the scriptures. Because they were not mighty in word, right? And you could say, well, someone could, could, could attempt to say, well, you know, the things in the Bible that we re need to really thrive in, the things in the Bible that we need to really emphasize in our lives are the things that we can put into practice. This is something you couldn't necessarily put into practice. This was a knowledge about the resurrection. This was the knowledge of knowing how the operation of those rising from the dead works, right? Or if they rise from the dead, even and still. And what does he say? He says, ye therefore do greatly err. Not just not knowing something in the Bible. Not having the knowledge of what the Bible taught about this. We have the command that's given to the kings of the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 17, 19 says this. And it shall be with him, speaking of the words of God, the Bible. And he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. Now I want, to notice, I want you to notice the order of that command that was given to him, right? Number one, he gave him a commandment to read the Bible every day. In the New Testament, you are considered a king and a priest. He's speaking out of the kings of the Old Testament, and he commands them... Don't just read your Bible sometimes. Don't just, don't, you know, he didn't say read your Bible once a week. He said this, and it shall be with him. Notice that. He needs to keep it with him. Why? And he shall read therein all the days of his life. Every day of your life you should be reading your Bible. Every day. He says he shall read therein all the days of his life. And why do we read? Just so that we can, you know, just have all this knowledge and get our brain puffed up and we can just go around preaching this to, to people? No. It says, all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God. So notice, that he wants them to be mighty in word. He wants them to know the Bible, but why? There's that word again. It says that. That as a result or consequence that they have read the Bible, they now put it into practice. That he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes. He wants them to. To be mighty in word, but not only mighty just in word. He wants them to be mighty in deed. He wants him, them to sit down and to read the Bible. And that tells me that if you sit down and you read the Old Testament, specifically is what he's referring to is the law of God. Do you know what it will cause you to do? Fear the Lord. Yeah. All these people that are just mock God, you know what we need to do is we need to just strap them down somewhere and just like read the law to them over and over and over again. Whether they like it or not, do you know what will happen? They'll begin to fear the Lord. They'll begin to fear God. You know, it's a good thing to, to read the law to your children. Because you know what will happen? As a child, they'll begin to fear God. Which is a good thing, not a bad thing. Amen. That's a good thing. If they fear God, that will stop them from doing things that they know they will be chastised for. Right. They're not going to go into a life of fornication. Why? Because they're afraid of the Lord. Right. They're not going to go into a life of, you know, lasciviousness, a life of, you know, theft, of thievery. They're not going to go into a life of sin. Why? Because they know that God is a God of punishment. You know why? You know all these Christians that have this idea, this false conception in their mind of God, that He is just this God that's all friendly? Do you know what those pastors need to do? 
They need to take off the skinny jeans and they need to go out there and preach from Exodus and Leviticus and all these other passages. And they need to cause the people in their audience, the people in the, because that's really what is an audience, not really a congregation. Right. Uh, the, those in their congregation to fear the Lord their God. You know what they, they came in, what if one day all of a sudden they took that pastor out and then, you know, Pastor Tyler Baker walked in. Don't you think that, you know, a lot of people when I started preaching, just a lot of the simple things that just to you guys may just seem like, I've heard that a million times, you don't even notice that I say it, would be highly offensive right. in these, these, you know, whatever you want to refer to these play center churches as. You know, these real soft churches, right? These non-denominational churches. Yeah. But do you know what it causes people to do? Do you know what it would do for those people? Immediately, when they start hearing verses, and if they truly believe the Bible, these are saved believers, it's going to cause them to fear God. Right. They're going to be like, man, that's scary. What if that happened to me? I'm living in fornication, and God did that to those people? And then every week they come in and they're hearing sermons like that? They're going to fear God. Right. Do you know, and you know what that's going to do? Because they become mighty in word, as a result of that, if they were to walk in the spirit, of course, God you know, gives us free will. But if you, if you read your Bible, the Bible teaches that a result of that, being mighty in word, you should be mighty in deed as well. A result of that should be that you're mighty in deed. Not only mighty in word, he wanted the kings to be, but also mighty in deed. The hardest part, of course, is to be mighty in deed. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. I'll get there myself. 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse number 11. The Bible says this. It's Paul speaking, and he says, uh, let's look, read verse uh, 10, 10 also. Let's look at verse 10. For his letters say they. So he's talking about himself from the perception of those that he's writing to. For his letters say they are weighty and powerful. Saying when he writes, his words are strong, right? The words that he writes, they're powerful, they're strong. And then he says this, but his bodily presence is weak. Saying when you look at him, you know, he, he doesn't look like he's that strong of a guy, right? He doesn't look like he's a powerful person, right? But it's the words that he speaks, they're powerful. He says, his, but his bodily presence is weak. It says, and his speech contemptible. Look at verse 11, though. Let such an one think this. He's saying a person that would say something like that, this is what they need to think. Let such an one think this, that such as we are in word by letters when we are absent, so that the same idea or the same you know, view that you have of me when you read my words and I'm not there, he says when we're absent, such will we be also indeed when we are present. So notice what Paul says. The same view and the same words that you hear me speak, don't listen to these other guys. What you need to understand is what I speak is exactly the things that I do. The way that, that I talk to you, you need to, this is what you need to understand. The power that my words have, my deeds are going to have the same power. So we can see that Paul was not a hypocrite. And, you, and those that are hypocrites, when they speak to you and they say something to you, their words don't mean much, do they? But someone that you already know has put these things into practice or has already done something that they're telling you to do, their words carry a lot more weight. And what did he say right here? He said, say, he said for his letters say they are weighty and powerful. We have that phrase that says, man, his words carry a lot of weight. Why? Because we know that that person is not a hypocrite. Because we know that that person, and we have Paul here, just another example of someone that the way, just... The, the, the perception, if you will, because we were just speaking of this a moment ago, just popped in mind, the perception, if you will, of how the Christians spoke, how Paul spoke, how Jesus spoke is so far off. Because you can see him saying, and speaking with authority, he says, for his letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his, and his speech contemptible. So he's, he's speaking on behalf of them saying, this guy, he, he speaks big, but his, his bodily presence is weak and powerful. He says, let such an one think this. He said, a person that would say them, let them think this. Let them understand this. That, such as we are in word by letters when we are absent, such will we be also in deed when we are present. He's saying, don't think that the things that I speak that I won't do as well. So we can see Paul just, you know, being a man is my point. Saying, when you hear my words and I write to you, and you don't think that I'm a hypocrite. What that's his point, his overall point is this. Don't think that the things that I say to you that I'm not going to perform. And this is where we need to be in our Christian life. We shouldn't be looked at as someone that his words aren't weight. They carry no weight. His words don't have any power. And what would be the reason why? Because he's, because he's a hypocrite. He just speaks these things, but he doesn't do them. 
right? Apollos, it did not record that Apollos did mighty deeds, but I bet he did. I, I would guarantee that he did. I turned you to that passage because he's someone that is actually referred to as being mighty in the scriptures. We can see him soul winning and performing that deed. Apollos isn't spoken of a lot. But if Apollos, I said that to say this, if Apollos, which is this hypothetical, if Apollos was only mighty in the scriptures, he only spoke and knew the Bible very well, but that he was just, he was lazy, he, you know, committed fornication, you know, he lived in a life of lasciviousness, like I'd said prior, he's a thief, he doesn't work, so he goes out and steals things to eat. How would you look at Apollos? His words would mean nothing to you, would they? When he's preaching the law of the Old Testament, you'd be like, dude, just Right? What you're saying to me means nothing. Because why? You want to hear it from someone that's not only mighty in the scriptures and mighty in word, but you want to hear it from someone that's mighty in deed also. You need to be not a hypocrite. You need to be one that is mighty in word. Study your Bible. Know your Bible. Don't err because you don't know the words of God. Right? You need to be mighty in word and mighty in deed. You say, I'm a Christian. If you are a Christian, you know what you need to do? What was Christ? How did his followers, Cleopas, how did he define him? What were the two elements of when they wanted to say he's a great man of God. Christ was mighty in deed and in word. If you say, I'm a Christian, you know what you need to be? Mighty in word and deed. Not only mighty in deed, not only mighty in word, mighty in word and mighty in deed. Now have you turn to 1 John chapter number 3, verse number 18. So we can see this played out again. Uh, we can see the admonitions, if you will, to not only be mighty in word, my, but also mighty indeed. There are a lot of Christians that make it to this first step or the first stepping stone. They study their Bible. They know their Bible. But you know what? They stop there. And they don't put things into practice. That's why a church would fail if the pastor only preached about learning the Bible. He only preached about study, excuse me, studying your Bible. He only preached about being mighty in the Scriptures. He only gave you doctrine. The church would fail if they didn't put things into practice. If he didn't if he didn't exhort them to put things into practice, and if they weren't reading the Bible on their own, the pastor would be failing, right? Look at 1 John chapter number 3. Look at, let's, let's begin reading actually 1 John 3. Let's look at verse 17. But whoso, so any person, but whoso hath this world's goods, so it's saying if you have the goods of this world, you know, things that we need such as food, let's say things like that. This world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him. Right? So, it does, you know, he doesn't have compassion. He's not helping this person out. He's not giving, you know, a brother who is in need the things that he needs when he has enough to give him. Right? He just, he doesn't have compassion on him. He doesn't help him out. It says again, but whoso hath this world uh, good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? Look at the next verse, verse 18. My little children, it's going to explain to you, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but watch this, but in deed and in truth. Now notice what he says, what loving in deed is, it's in truth. So if you're actually doing it, you know, that's you doing something in truth, right? He said, don't just love in word, but you need to actually perform it. Don't just say, hey, I love you. You know, when this guy's just, you know, the, you know, someone comes to you and they're in need, they're hungry, and you're just like, you know what, I love you, buddy. I love you a lot. And then you just walk away. The guy's going to be like, prove it to me. Show me you love me. And what, and what does John tell them, right? The church that he's writing to or those that he's writing to, he tells them, don't just love in word, but love in deed and in truth. Don't just say something. Don't just say you love people. Actually perform the word. Actually, you know, hey, you should help the other brothers. You know that you should love your neighbor, right? That's what he's speaking of when he speaks about a brother. You know that you should love your neighbor. You know the Bible. You know the commands. But actually do it. Actually put it into practice. Don't just read the Bible and, and store the commands in your mind. Do them. Put them into practice. Amen. They need to be a deed that's, that's being played out in your life, that's being performed in your life. Yeah. Don't just love your brothers and sisters in Christ in word. Don't just come here and just say, hey, I love you, brother, but then just don't help someone when they actually need it. Love them in deed. I had to look at another passage here. Go to, uh, this is a parallel that I've never seen drawn, but it's a super strong parallel with what we just read in James chapter number 2. <clears throat> 
Go to James chapter number 2. It's interesting because in James 1, we'll read there first. In James 1, look at James 1, verse 21. It says, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. So notice he's, he's telling them to receive the word, right? And then he says this, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. He's saying, so when you receive the word, when you hear the word and you receive it, you believe it, right? And someone gives you a command and you're like, yeah, I know I, I need to be doing that. Someone teaches you, love your neighbor, right? He's saying, don't only be a hearer of the word, but a doer also. What is he telling? Telling them, don't just, don't just hear the word. Don't be mighty in the word, but you need to be mighty in deed as well. Keep reading there. Watch what he says. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in, in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Verse 25. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, talking about the word of God, specifically the law, the things that we should be doing, the statutes or the commands, if you will, it says, and continueth therein. He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. So notice God says that he will bless you if you not only hear the word, but that you will do it. He also teaches here, if you just hear a command and you don't start practicing it, what's going to happen? You're going to forget it. If you're doing something every day, you're going to remember that. Obviously, you remember that the Bible. So you know what you should do when you hear a sermon? This is a very practical sermon, so here's a very practical tip. If I preach something in the Bible that you've never put into practice in your life, you know what you should do immediately when you leave? You should be looking for an opportunity to practice that in your life. Because you know what's going to happen? Believe me or not, but this is what the Bible teaches. You will forget that particular law. You will forget that particular teaching is what will happen. You will be a forgetful hearer is what will happen. You, but you know what? You know the way to remember it? Is to start practicing it immediately. You'll just become somebody that's mighty in word and not mighty in deed, and then you would be a hypocrite. That would be the only other option besides forgetting it. Then you would just be going around speaking it to people and not doing it, and then your words hold no weight. I don't want to listen to you. I don't want to listen to somebody who gives a great soul winning presentation, but nobody never gets anybody saved. I don't want, I don't want your advice. I'd rather go to somebody who actually does it all the time, right? Amen. Keep that in mind and look over at James chapter number 2. And watch what it says here, James chapter number 2, look at verse number 13. For he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. So he's, in this passage, I'll give you a quick run, and you can check this out later. I know different people have different interpretations of this. I'll give you just in a nutshell what I believe this is talking about. It's speaking of a Christian, like we were talking about in James, James chapter number 1, who has faith, but their faith is dead because they are mighty in word only and not mighty in deed. They are a Christian that is not acting it out. They have faith, but their faith is dead. You, couldn't, you wouldn't say someone has dead faith if they don't have faith at all. That makes zero sense. And that's what this person is doing. If you are a person that is mighty in word only, you are a person of dead faith. You have faith, but your faith is dead because it's not helping anyone. It's not benefiting anyone. Look at what it says in verse 14. Well, what doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he have faith and have not works, can faith save him? Verse 15. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. What are they doing? Remember 1 John, where we just read? They love, they love the person in word. He said, don't just love them in word, love them in deed. And right here, what do you have them doing? Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, right? Yeah. They're loving them in word, right? He says, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding, you give, you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? So when we see it saying there, what doth it profit, what's it talking about? What does it profit you? No, it's saying, what does it profit that person, right? When you look up at verse number 14, when it says, What doth the prophet, my, my brethren, though a man say he have faith and have not works, can faith save him? Is it saying, what does it profit him? No, it's saying, what are you profiting other people if you, just, if you have faith and you're not doing it? If a man say he have faith, he, what is he doing? He's, he's mighty in word, but he's not mighty in deed. He's a hypocrite. Now, another tip real quick, just because we're here, and people sometimes have a misunderstanding of this. When it says, can faith save him? This is always extremely important. I've given you guys this tip multiple times. The words, you know, let me say this first. 
this, this is the tip that I was referring to just now. When you're trying to define something, right? You always define it according to the Bible, right? But very often times, you will find your cross-references or your answers in the book that you are looking for itself. When you look up the word save in the book of James, every single time, you know what it's talking about? A physical salvation. I, I didn't look this up, but let's try to remember where these are real quick. So look at James chapter number... Um, let's look at James chapter number 5. I know where that one is at the very end. James chapter number 5. It says, verse number 14, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Is that a spiritual salvation or a physical salvation? Physical salvation. You look up save in the Old Testament, almost every time it's talking about physical salvation. The word save does not only mean you're saved from hell. The word saved just means they're rescued from something, right? So right here we see the word saved being used as referring to physical salvation. Maybe somebody else can help me out with this, but it's... Oh, there it is. Look at James chapter... I, think, I believe that's it. Yeah, verse number 4. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. Chapter 4, verse 11. Speak not evil one, one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. Notice that doer of the law. The whole book of James keeps that, that same theme of actually putting the word into practice and into deed. Look at verse 12. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? Verse 13. Go to now. Ye that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life that is even a vapor. What is he talking about? Losing your physical life. Right? And when he's saying that there is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy, who art thou that judgest another? He goes on to say, like, don't say you have tomorrow. You're going to live this hypocritical life and just say, oh, I can go into this city. Let's buy and sell and get gain. He's like, what is your life? Is it not even a vapor? that appeared for a little time and vanished with away. He's talking about your physical life, right? So he's speaking of being saved. We saw in chapter 5. We see in chapter 4. It's a salvation of being physically saved. Further proof in context. Look back at James chapter number 2. Look back at, uh, we'll begin reading in verse number 8. If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect of, to persons, ye commit sin. And are convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, also said also, do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. And then he says this, so speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy that have showed no mercy. And he says, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. Then he says, after that, in the next verse, can faith save him? Save him for what? The judgment that God will take your life if you want to be a hypocrite. The judgment of God, if you're not going to help somebody else, right? If you're not going to actually be mighty indeed, if you're just going to say that you're doing the law, you're keeping the commandments, you, you, know, you know already you should love your neighbor, but if you want to commit adultery with your neighbor's wife and not love your neighbor... If you don't have mercy on others, God is not going to have mercy on you and he will judge you. Can faith save him from judgment, from the judgment of God? And then we look, so in context, that's clearly what we, what we can see it's talking about. And then we look up the word save, and one time that is clear as day in chapter 5, it's talking about being saved from a physical death, isn't it? I believe in James chapter 5, it actually saved is used one more time. Yeah, it's, it's used very at the very end. It says in verse 18 again, uh, in chapter 5, 18, you don't have to turn over if you don't want to. And he prayed again, speaking of Elijah, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, talking about a brother, what's the whole thing about, you know, brothers, that, actual Christians loving their neighbors, right? It's talking about Christians and, and uh, you know, actually putting things into practice. So if a brother goes into sin and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth, converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death. Why did he save him from death? Because God's going to judge him. 
Because God is, the lawgiver is the one that's able to save and to destroy, and he will destroy you as you're referring to your physical life. He will take your physical life. You're not going to have mercy on others. Because the Christian, where does, where does the Christian get judged? Now. Now is when the Christian gets, done, gets judged. You know, for, it says, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of the Lord. And then he says this in, in 1 Peter chapter 4. It says, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of the Lord. And then it says, and what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Saying, we get judged now. But how much worse is their punishment going to be then? How much worse of a punishment? What's the end going to be of them that don't obey the gospel? We obey the gospel of God and God judges us now. But how much worse is their end going to be? God judges us in this life. Right. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter number 12, verse number 6, it says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receives. The son, if you become a son of God, God begins to chasten you. He doesn't wait. Oh, you're a son, but I'm not going to chasten you until late. No, he starts chasing you as soon as you become a son of God. Those that are sons of God are those that have received him, right? The Bible also says it's, it speaks of a different condemnation and a different damnation. Of the Christian and of the world in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11 at the very end. He says that we don't have the same condemna condemnation of the world. Why? Because we obey the gospel of God and we're judged now. We don't just get away scotch-free, right? But the world has a much worse. What shall the end be of them which obey not the gospel of God? Saying, I've obeyed the gospel of God and I haven't gotten away scotch-free. But it's going to be much, much worse on them. Why? Because the condemnation of the world is different because they go to hell. We at least are saved from hell, right? So in James chapter number 2, wasn't even a part of my sermon, but in James chapter number 2, when he talks about can faith save him, it's saying just having faith, just, just having the word of God in your heart and believing the word of God, but not actually putting it into practice. If you're not going to show mercy on this guy, God's not going to show mercy on you. And you know what he's going to do? He's the lawgiver. He's able to save and to destroy. And guess what? What is your life? It's even a vapor. God can take it away like that. That's what he says. He's warning you that God is the, the, the lawgiver and he is the one that's able to save and to destroy. So you know what? Don't just have faith that you should love your neighbor. Don't just have faith you know, that the word of God is true and all of these things. Don't just be mighty in the word. Be mighty in deed. You need to not only just believe the Bible, you need to not only read the Bible, you need to not only know the Bible, you're greatly erring if you don't do those things. But you need to take the next step from knowing the Bible to putting the, putting the Bible, putting the Word of God in practice. Amen. Don't just say, hey, I love you, brother. When that brother's in need of something, help him. Show him that. You know what? You think he's going to be more convinced because you just tell him every day? Or let's say you told him a few times and then when he's really in need... And there's something, you know, a, a very difficult task you come through on. What do you think is going to stick out in his mind more? When you actually go and you do it for him, right? right? When you actually tell him, I love you, but then you back it up and your words actually have weight. Right. You know why Apollos was, you know, his words were regarded? Was because he was in the temple. He, it wasn't just somebody who just sat in his house and just studied the Bible all day. You know, like all of these people who claim to be, you know, scholars and claim to be theologians and claim to know the Bible real well, you'd never catch James White out knocking doors. Are you kidding me? That'd be the weirdest sight in the world. Those kind of guys, they just read the Bible and they, and number one, they forget it because they don't put it into practice and they don't even understand half of it in the first place. But those kind of guys, that if they, if a person was saved and did that, which they do. Did the, you know just reading the Bible like all these people studied the scriptures but didn't do it? They'd be a forgetful hearer or they would be a hypocrite, one of the two. They would forget it, number one, if they didn't start putting it into practice. But let's say they just read the Bible all the time so it was in their mind. Then they would just be a hypocrite. Your words have no weight. Why, why was, you know, when, when Cleopas and the man was confronted by Jesus, which they didn't know was Jesus... They wanted to describe him as being a great man of God. What did they say? He's mighty in deed and word. He wasn't just somebody that went around preaching the book of Mark, all the Gospels, but especially the book of Mark records all the great deeds that Jesus Christ did. He wasn't lazy. He put everything into practice. We need to not only know the Bible, read the Bible, we need to actually put it into practice. Amen. Amen. We need to actually do these things, right? Go over to Colossians Chapter number... Actually, you go to Hebrews 5. I'll read you from Colossians. 
Colossians chapter number 3, verse number 17, we can see this phrase used again. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by him. So what is the, what is the implication there? You should be doing things in word, right? But you should also be doing them in deed. You should tell your brothers that you love them. You should speak kindly. You should have hospitality through your words. You should have charity through your words, right? You should be preaching the gospel. There's a lot of things that will just be words, right? You should give advice. You should admonish. You should exhort. You should preach the Bible. You should speak as of the oracles of God. But what else should you do? You should do things in deed, too. There are things that you learn from the word, and the words that we speak should be the word, but there are things that you learn from the word that need to be put into practice. Things that you speak, you should be doing as well. You should be just speaking charitably, but then not being charitably as in need. You should be doing both, right? right. Hebrews chapter number 5, we can see this. Whoops. Hebrews chapter number 5, we can see this talked about again of being a forgetful hearer. And this is the biggest fear. You know, this is the, the biggest fear is all the great truths that you've learned in the Bible. You know, just like when Jesus Christ talked about the parable of the sower, there are people that will hear the gospel. Think about how fearful that is. They'll hear the gospel. They'll even, I'm sure there are people that even grasp it. But then what happens? They leave. They don't believe it right then. They don't choose to put their trust in Christ. 15, 20 years down the road, they don't even remember the true way of salvation. Isn't that scary? A scary thought. They don't even know how to get there anymore. It's gone. Why? Because they didn't actually perform it. They didn't actually do it. Well, the, even though you're saved, and even though you're obviously never going to forget the gospel, there are a lot of truths in this book that are practical and beneficial to your life that you may need in a specific situation or circumstance in the future, that if you don't start trying to perform them now in, in small, minor ways, in any opportunity that you get, when you actually really need it in the future, it's not going to benefit you any. Why? Because you're going to forget it. Look at Hebrews chapter number 5. We can see this talked about again. Look at verse 10. Called of God, speaking of Jesus, and high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. He's saying, I can tell you more things about it, but you're dull of hearing. What's, just, what's crazy about that is, you know what the most difficult book in the New Testament is? The book of Hebrews. Probably the most difficult book in the whole Bible. And Paul's like, I could tell you more, but you wouldn't even understand it. It's like, what kind of great revelations did Paul receive? Or what, how, what further did he know and understand that he didn't right now? When in his most difficult book, he's like, you guys are dull of hearing. You guys don't, I could tell you more, but you just don't understand it. So that's interesting. Nothing to do with the sermon, but it's interesting. Look at verse 12. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers. Why should they be teachers? They're the, they're the Jews, right? They're the Hebrews. They were the ones that committed the oracles of God. So you say, it's the time when you guys should be the one that are teaching. Time you ought to be teachers. Ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. So the first, remember the word oracle that was used earlier? He said, you know, we should speak as of the oracles of God. Oracle just means word. It refers to the mouth. But an oracle is something that's spoken, right? He said, you need someone to teach you, which be the first principles of the oracles basic truths of the Bible. And what's the reason? Because they didn't put it into practice, of course. Look at the end of there. And are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Verse 13. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Verse 14. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, saying a mature Christian, this would be a perfect Christian, this would be someone that is truly furnished unto all good works. It says, but strong meat belongeth to them that are full age, even those. So now he's going to further tell us who these people are. Even those who by reason of use. So what's the reason why these people are of full age? What's the reason why they're not on the milk anymore? By reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So what really is what takes you to that next step of being the full Christian, of being the mature Christian, of being perfect or complete or truly furnished? A babe in Christ, he said, is someone that just does things in word. They just, they're on the, the milk, and you're, you can't take the next step because even that which you have already received, the milk of the word, 
You haven't grown any because you haven't exercised that. That's what he's explaining. You haven't, you know, taken the second step. You haven't moved on from that onto the next step of Christianity because that which you have already received, you couldn't build upon that because you didn't use it. And I had to reteach it to you. That's what he's saying. Why did he have to reteach it to them? Because they weren't putting it into practice. What happens when you don't put things into practice? You forget it. Right? Either you forget it. These are the two types of people that you're going to be if you're just a person that's mighty in word. Either you will forget, you will be a forgetful hearer, or you will be a hypocrite. That's the type of Christian you will be. There's really three options of a Christian. There's, you, know, you can even say there are four. That, you know, at the bottom of the barrel, a person that's never read the Bible at all, knows, no, knows nothing of the Bible. You know, just the Christian that is just pure flesh, basically. Their just soul is saved. And they're just walking in the flesh only all the time from the time that they got saved until the time they died. What a sad life to live. The next person would be the person that receives the word, right? But they never put it into practice. They just come and they keep learning things and forgetting it repeatedly. What are they? The forgetful here, right? You know what the third person is? The person that just maybe keeps studying it and they understand it because they're repeating it all the time and they know it but they're a hypocrite. Their words have no weight. They aren't able to help other people because no one takes them serious. Right? They're just a hypocrite. They, and what else would happen? What's possible that could happen to, a, to that person? Well, God could judge them, number one, for not showing mercy, for saying that they love their neighbor, but not actually loving their neighbor. God would judge that person, take their life, you know, earlier on and you know, uh, to when they would have lived out longer. And then number four, do you know that is the Christian that we should strive to be because we're trying to be Christ-like. And what was Christ? They wanted to describe him. They said he was mighty in deed and in word. That's a full Amen. Christian. That's a complete Christian. That's a Christian that has the scriptures, receives the scriptures, puts it into practice, and he's truly furnished unto all good works. And what does he refer to as being perfect? What does perfect mean? Being a complete Christian. We need to strive. We may not, we're not, you know, not may not, we will never be exactly like Christ. But that should be our goal. Just like uh, Paul talks about in the book of Philippians. Our goal should be to strive to be like Christ. And to put it in its most simple form, a practical sermon for you, to have goals of where you should go from here on, number one, it starts right here. Don't err not knowing the Bible. Be mighty in word, right? Know the word and know it well enough to where you can teach it to others, you can speak it. But don't be a hypocrite. Actually put it into practice. Be mighty in word and in deed. Like, the, like our Christ, like our Lord and Savior was. Let's bow our hands and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for being the perfect example for, for not being a hypocrite, dear Lord God, of course, and for uh, being mighty in word and mighty in deed. All the truths that we can learn from your, from your own mouth, the truths that you spoke, dear Lord God, and that we can just study those words and learn them but not only that, we also have just the examples of the record of all the great works that you did, dear Lord. Help us to, to be humble, dear Lord God, and to, to always just strive and understand all of our flaws so that we're in a, a place where we can actually uh, fix the problems in our lives. We love you so much. Just be with us and bless this church. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.